Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Works of service are a pretty popular thing right now. I think the COVID pandemic helped push that narrative a little bit too. And I'm not knocking it at all. We need more people to be focused on helping out others. Uh, during the crisis, some of the biggest ways people have been able to help each other um, are by picking up groceries and prescriptions, running errands for high-risk folks who shouldn't leave their homes, you know, doing things like that. Again, things like that are great, but sometimes I wonder if our idea of what qualifies as an act of service is a little misguided. When we think about acts of service, maybe our minds go too quickly to some grand gesture that uh, means really going out of your way to do something for someone else. How many hours does your shift at the soup kitchen have to be before it counts? How many weekends spent picking up trash by the highway make it a true act of service? How many times do you have to do the dishes at home before you can say you're serving your wife? Now, I am being a little facetious. I, I don't think a lot of people actually operate that way. But we do have a tendency to magnify the big things that make us go out of our way and diminish the little things that we do. And when we talk about our why church question today, why should the heart of a Christian be focused on serving others, we have to face that issue head on. Because when God talks about Christian service, he tells us what it does and doesn't do and what really counts as service. So let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, Ephesians unfolds a lot of the mysteries about our daily life. Paul shows us that the world isn't just spinning out of control, as sometimes it might feel like. Uh, you are not the captain of your own life. And that's good. I know some of you are planners and can appreciate good planning, Right? You constantly are checking your calendar app on your phone. Maybe you even have more than one. And God is a planner too. And you are a very big part of his plans. In chapter 1, Paul explains that the plans God has for us individually began even before he created the world. He unfolded a world that he created in six days. And now, in the center of it all, he places you and me. Our purpose is partially lived out in the chances to serve others that he places before us. Like in Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, everything Adam and Eve did in caring for the garden was a facet of their calling. Even simple tasks brought joy and honor. Contrast that with today when terms like jobs or work and housework or homework, they don't sound so lofty and spiritual, do they? And what emotions emerge when people mention Monday? For some, that is the worst day of the week because it's the day when you have to go back to work or school after a weekend of freedom. We get caught in the complaining and weariness of doing the same old thing day in and day out. Where we were meant to find joy in our works of service now, now it just seems like a struggle. Adam and Eve's disobedient actions in the Garden of Eden set off this negative chain reaction for the rest of humanity. Now our acts of service are laced with pain and interruptions and weariness. We're tempted to say that, that there must be more to it than this. And there is more to it. God is not removed from his world. Nothing happens without, his, without conforming to his greater purpose and will for us. He gives us the opportunity to serve as parents and care for children, to teachers to develop our abilities and employers to give us work and helpful products and firefighters and police to protect us all called into their station to accomplish God's working of providing and protecting his world. God gets his tasks done through people like you and me to benefit others. Now, of course, you can raise many objections about the evil and abuse that lurks there. Look at the leaders who just abuse their power repeatedly. Look at the abusive spouses or parents. Look at the crooked employers and employees. And don't forget that the devil 
is continually active behind the scenes. Stop and look at how he affects you. How your approach to the service God calls you to be in your life. Has it ever been pure? Have you displayed godliness with contentment in them? Do you approach them with joy instead of complaint? Truth be told, God's justice demands that he punish those who don't willingly and perfectly obey him and serve others and carry out the tasks that he has given them. But before we go on, let's get something straight. We don't gain any favorable standing before God by the, the type of jobs, our tasks, our positions, or even our performance in them. Our acts of service are really worthless when it comes to being saved. God could point out the fault with all of them, no matter how spiritual they may seem on the outside. But if you go into your Bible, you also discover the heart of the one who calls you. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God had a plan. Peter told the crowd at Pentecost, This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. Because of his grace toward us, God set up a plan to condemn his own son in our place in the heavenly court of justice. We were mere spectators as Jesus took on himself the full punishment for our miserable failings. He snatched us from the curse of hell itself. The most important task for our lives to find favor with God is finished. Finished for us by someone else. And the holy work of Jesus not only meant death on the cross, but was woven into every daily task from birth until death. Each and every task was of utmost importance, no matter how small it may have seemed, around the house, neighborhood, or synagogue. Willingly doing what was expected of him was the spiritual obedience of Jesus that freed us because of our miserable failings to to do so perfectly. The main goal of his task, however, was to bring glory to God for the grace that rescued us. So what a relief it is to know that our standing with God isn't based on what we do, but on what Christ did. That changes our whole perspective and focus on life. Think about it. He paid the price. We owe him our lives. Even more than that, he is our life. He guarantees his plans for us unfolded at the proper moment. Plans to keep us close to him. Plans that put us in touch with God himself. Plans to accomplish his purpose for us. So like Paul, our motto becomes for me to live as Christ, even in my daily tasks. There are many callings in the world, but our calling as Christians raises us up into a special union with Jesus himself. Look back at the waters of baptism when you were buried with him and raised with him through, through faith in the power of God. God made you alive with Christ. It makes us princes and princesses of the king of the universe. It gives us standing and respect in the eyes of the one who counts. This is what separates the works of Christians from the rest. We find our meaning and purpose of anything that we do wrapped up in him and not in us. When our lives are lived not for ourselves but for God, what seems to be menial, everyday tasks turn grand and holy in God's sight. Just like it said in verse 10, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Although we aren't saved by our good works, but Jesus is, Good works are what God had in mind for us. In fact, he handcrafted each of us for specific tasks that he prepared in advance for us to do. Look at the opportunities to serve right in front of you. They are God calling you to respond with loving obedience to him in the daily things you do. He gets as much pleasure in those done from your heart as as when you sing hymns in church. Your obedient faithfulness to your tasks is setting you up for a grander purpose than you can imagine in a time that God has planned out for you. You see, the tasks of God's callings are not just what happen at church. They're also in the details of our daily life. There isn't one act of service that isn't affected by by or doesn't affect our relationship with Jesus. Our calling into him breaks down this fake barrier between the sacred and the secular works of service in our life, weaving all of life into a seamless web of faith and love and action. Our calling gives to everyday tasks a special dignity and spiritual significance under God. And don't forget that when we were small, God used those type of tasks of home to feed and clothe you and me, to mold our personalities and values. It's how God cares for his family. And now he takes care of people through your 
tasks, caring for children, doing housework, helping neighbors. They're not routine and unspiritual. They are ways of serving the Lord. Meals have to be prepared. Floors have to be clean. Garbage has to be collected. All a part of God's care for the world. There isn't one task at work or home that isn't removed from our attitude of worship. Martin Luther King Jr. said, If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted. So well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, Here lives a great street sweeper who did his job well. Your job is not just a way to get a paycheck or recognition or a school a, a way to get good grades or attention. They are ways to glorify God with the gifts that he has given you. Whether at home or work, Paul says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do. There's always a bit of a mystery to our calling, wondering what God is intending with our tasks in life. Is this truly what he wants me to do, to, to continue to do? What is my purpose? And how do I know? God tells us to take our everyday ordinary life and tasks, eating, going to work or school, things around the house, and place them with our whole life before God as an offering to him. Those are our acts of service. Through his powerful word, the Holy Spirit will transform you to understand what is best in his eyes and find joy in living out his perfect plan and know that's the plan for you. Live for that audience of one, not you, not your boss, not your parents, but looking for the approving, delighted eyes of Jesus alone. It is approaching everything with this prayer. Let this task be lived for you, Jesus. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I mean, kids throw temper tantrums. Customers get angry. We get hurt on the job site. Everything seems to try our patience and peace of mind. But when the task seems too large or we feel we can't handle it, when we fail to decipher the purpose behind the task of our present calling, he is right there to support us with his power and build trust in his ways. Life makes sense when we accept our valuable place in his plan. Our daily tasks aren't about our success or comfort, but about something bigger. Displaying his grace to others so they too might believe in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus. With that big picture in mind, we have really one job description no matter what the task. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he appears. Did your tasks do that this past week? In the morning before all the parts of life rush at you, spend some time in quiet prayer grasping your calling in the daily tasks ahead of you. Throughout your day and everything you do at home, work, church, and the community, let this be in the prayer in your heart. Let this task be lived for you, Jesus. Amen. And now, may this peace of God that goes beyond all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.